These are some hard days. We've had some heartache more than enough. And long, long are these cold nights. Feels like there's no light. But fear says give up. Again, good morning, everybody. Let's all stand together and sing. This is a new song for us, but you'll know all the words. I already know you will. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Our redeemed, our redeemed, praise the Lord. Sing again. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I redeem, I redeem, praise the Lord. I redeem, I love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. I have been, I have been redeemed. I redeem, I love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine, and all to Him I have been, I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my 
seated. How are y'all doing today? Well, about 15 of you doing all right. Let's try that again. How are you doing today? That's good. It's good to see you in the Lord's house this morning. I know it's Labor Day weekend, and we've got a lot of folks that are going to be traveling out of town this weekend, so keep them in your prayers. But thank you for being here today. If you are our guest today, we want to welcome you to Central and tell you how much we appreciate you coming to worship with us this morning. We ask you, if you don't mind, doing us a small favor in the seat back in front of you, you'll see a card called a Connect card. If you'll take that card out and fill it out today before leaving, we would love to have a record of your visit with us. We invite you to stop by our Connect table out in the lobby as you're going out. It'll be to your left right over by the water fountain. And uh, so if you'll just stop and drop that card with the folks that are there at the conclusion of service today, they're going to give you one of our guest bags, our way of saying thank you for coming to worship with us today. There's some goodies in it just for you. And there's also some information about some of our Bible studies and some of our ministries and we would love the opportunity to reach out to you just to share with you some of the great things that God's doing here and some of the great ministries that we have that you can be a part of. In fact, if you've been coming to church for a while and you're not serving, you will notice a QR code sticker on that envelope holder on the back of your chair and also on our offering boxes. If you'll just scan that QR code with your phone, it will bring up a place where you can sign up to serve. And we always, always need more people helping us serve. On Sundays, it takes about 100 to 150 people signed up to volunteer to help serve to make everything happen that happens. We've got security, we've got greeters, kids world workers, lots of stuff going on. So we could use your help. If you've not serving anywhere, please scan that code, pick an area, and we will be in touch with you. I've got a few announcements that I want to share with you real quick. Today and next Sunday, if you've noticed coming in all the tables out there with balloons on them, those are sign up for our life groups. If you are already in a life group and you're gonna continue to go to that same life group, I'm asking you if you don't mind, go sign up again, just so they have a full list, so they know who will be coming to their home 
for their group meeting because, you know, some, we, we max out at a certain size, okay? So we wanna make sure that we're able to fit everybody who wants to come. So there's a lot of groups back there. We ask you to please go look through them. If you're not in a group, please get in a group. There is also a map on the back wall with little tacks, kind of show you the area of town where each group meets. So you can try to pick one that's maybe geographically close to you to make it easier for you. We would love for you to be a part. So we'll be taking signups today and next Sunday. And then on Sunday the 10th, our life groups start that afternoon. And then also on Sunday the 10th, Awana Club starts from 2 to 3.30 here in the Family Life Center. And then fellas, next Saturday, September the 9th, is our men's prayer breakfast. How many of you have already gone online and signed up? Show of hands. Man, that's good, but there's a lot of men in here whose hands didn't go up. We want you to come, get fattened up, get some good breakfast, some good fellowship, and a good time of prayer together. We'll start at eight o'clock next Saturday morning in the Family Life Center. We will be done by about 9.15. So I'm asking you to go to our website, cbc.live, click on the sign up tab, scroll down to the men's prayer breakfast, and get signed up. We would love to see you there with us. This time, let's all stand together. We're fixing to sing together again. But before we do, let's go to the Lord and ask his blessing on this service today. Father, we love you, and God, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us and the blessings that you've given to us. We thank you and praise you, God, for the health that we have to be in your house today. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless our time of worship together, and I pray, Lord, that your, your word today would minister to our hearts, that you would meet us right where we're at, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue singing this morning. Slain. On that 
that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations see worthy is the lamb who was slain myself and just getting myself putting my energy out there in the world i like making money i'll admit that so um i just really want to do well i live to be happy i live for myself to do something great and achieve success and to be somebody and not nobody when you're done with this life what do you hope to leave behind hmm. that's a good question i have no idea you haven't thought about it at all no not really No, I just want to be in heaven. <laughs> That's all. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Good question. I hadn't really thought about it. I don't intend to die. Um, I think everyone wants to make an impact, but I have no delusions. So, you know, as long as everybody looks back and says, oh, he was a cool guy, I think I'm cool with that. First John, chapter 1, again. <clears throat> I saw some things that I was guilty of that I 
thought I'd better go back and talk about this morning. So if you can get anything out of the message, that'll be great. But we're going to be reading out of 1 John chapter 1. And if you'll stand with me. Find my glasses where I can see. Let me just pick up at verse number 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Father, it's our simple prayer this morning that you would open our hearts, that you would clear our minds, and that the Spirit of God would illuminate to us the truth of your word as it applies to our life. Help us this morning, Lord, to be ministered to by the Spirit of God and help us to be able to leave this place this morning saying, that the Lord spoke to my heart, and I'm going to obey his instructions. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> All of us have fought the battle of whether we will confess our sins or whether we will cover our sins. Anybody who's a parent who had multiple children in their household have dealt with this issue. Something goes wrong in the household. Somebody did something. And so as a mother or a father, we begin to try to investigate who the violator was. And it seems that every one of the kids deny that it was them. I didn't do it, not me. And you go, whether it's like in my case, three children, and you're getting all these, all of these confessions of I'm innocent, somebody else must have done it. Folks, that's not just a problem with kids growing up. It's a lifelong problem. Man is always in a dilemma of whether we will confess our sin or whether we will cover up our sin. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13 says, And he that covers his sin, he that hides his sin, he that denies his sin shall not prosper. But whosoever confesseth, and forsaketh them, shall find mercy. Better to confess than to cover up. I think the main distinction between the Christian and the unbeliever is that a Christian confesses sin. But there is coming a day when all secrets will be unveiled what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 in verse 5. He said, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will bring both to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. For the godly, for the disclosure uh, of that day will be rewarding because the Bible tells us when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ over in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 3 that for the godly all sins 
have been revealed, confessed, and have been covered. For the ungodly, it'll be a disclosure of everything that they've denied and covered up. It's going to be a day of revelation. All sin is against God. And God will judge all sin for the believer. All sin has been judged in the person of Jesus Christ. When you gave Jesus Christ your life, when you accepted his sacrifice on your behalf, God covered all of your sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you stand in the presence of the judgment seat of Christ, God will never bring up one sin that was committed by you in this life. For the unbeliever who's denied Christ, who's rejected forgiveness. Every sin that they have ever committed that's not been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 20 says, they will be judged, they will be condemned, and they will be damned forever in the presence of God because they covered their sin. You remember when we discussed it a few weeks ago, when David sinned against Bathsheba, David broke four of the last five commandments. He coveted, he stole, he committed adultery, and he murdered. And yet when he, he was brought to repentance, David said in Psalm 51 and verse number four, he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. David's not denying that he sinned against himself, that he sinned against Bathsheba, that he sinned against Uriah, that he sinned against the nation of Israel. But he's saying that sin is primarily, all sin is against God. And true confession of sin is not just admitting that you did something, but you're admitting that you did it to God. In 1 John, this confession of sin uh, becomes a test for our salvation. And as I mentioned in the past, there are four tests that John gives in his epistle to validate our Christian confession. What is our belief in Jesus Christ? What is our view of sin? Are we obedient to the Word of God in our life? And do we love the brethren. And if a person passes all four of those tests, he gives positive evidence that he's a believer. An unbeliever denies the true Christ. They deny their sin. They do not obey the word of God. And they have no loving compassion for the brethren. Now in the text this morning that we're going to look at, we're going to again go back and look at this test of sin because no matter what a person claims to be their view of sin is a clear indicator as to whether they're a Christian or an un, a non uh, non-believer or unchristian or unsaved uh, most of these people to whom John is writing every one of them claimed to be Christians they all claimed to be born again. They all claimed to be saved. To many people, sin is not properly understood. That's why in verse 10 it says, and they say, we have not sinned. And I ask the question, how could anyone conceivably make such a claim as that? There are, are, are many people who object to being called sinners. And they insist it with great objection. I am not a sinner. Don't call me a sinner. Why is that? Because they believe they are righteous and they are sinless enough that God would never reject them. I think there's two classes of people in the world today when it comes to the sin issue. There are those who are blinded by their sin. They are spiritually dead to God. 
Paul over in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4, and you've heard me quote this verse hundreds of times. If our gospel is hid, it is hid, it is unknown to those who are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded their minds, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Ephesians 2 and verse 1 and 5, he said, And you have God quickened who were dead in your trespasses and sin. Verse 5, For even when we were dead in our sins, God quickened us together with Christ, for we are saved by grace. Ephesians 4 verse 18, Having their understanding darkened, being alienated, being severed, being dead, being cut off from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 simply identifies them this way. They are spiritually discerned. God is transmitting but they don't have a receiver to receive what God is transmitting. Why? Because they are spiritually dead. It, they do not see. They do not recognize. They do not understand the, the damning and condemning power of sin in their life. And therefore, as they walk in darkness... They have no light uh, to illuminate the sin in their life. Thus, they deny it. Verse 8, verse 10, we don't have any sin. Uh, well, we have no sin. And the verse 8 says, they deceive themselves. Verse 10 says that they defame the very person of God. Then there are those people not only who are spiritually blinded, who are spiritually dead, but then there are those people, they're kind of like the Jews of Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, uh, they, were, they were what we would call religious perfectionists. It's a person who actually believes that they can achieve a state of sinlessness. They believe in Christ, but their belief that they're once saved makes them believe that now they become so righteous as they can achieve a state of sinlessness and righteousness and purity before God. They believe that the Holy Spirit will enable them to walk perfectly before God. Now I want you to notice the problem with both classes of people. They do not have a clear view and a clear understanding of sin. To them, sin is only those gross violations of the law and morality, those things that society will look upon and call gross errors or gross sin, murder, Fraud, rape, physical abuse. I mean, the kind of things that society looks down upon. And they see as society a violation against society and humanity. They fail to see that what sin is, is it is a violation of the word of God, the way of God, and the will of God. God, who is perfect Therefore, God uh, is, demands sinless perfection. What is sin? It is coming short of God's glory. It is falling short of God's expectation. Sin is falling short of what God says we must do. Sin is missing the mark. Sin is when a man's mind is filled with wickedness and immoral and selfish thoughts. To God, sin is acting unloving. It is speaking unkindly. It is living selfishly and greedily. It's being dishonest both in words and in actions. It's dishonoring God. It dishonors his word. It dishonors his church. All men fall short in so many areas of their life. We fall short in our worship of God.
We fall short in our prayer life. We shall fall short in the study of the reading of the Word of God, which God gave to us as directions for our life, how we can live a whole and wholesome and happy life. We fall short in loving others. We fall short in caring for the souls of mankind. We are sinners who need a Savior, and Jesus Christ came to save us by the shedding of his sinless blood. That's what John says in verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his sin, cleanseth us from all sin. God's word tells us that we're sinners. And if we deny that we're sinners, what he says in verse 8, we deceive ourselves and God's truth is not in us. In verse 10, he says, we say we have no sin and we make God a liar and his word does not dwell within us. Paul said to Titus in Titus 3 and verse 3, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. There was a time in our life when we were foolish we were disobedient. We deceived uh, serving divers' lust and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy. We were hateful and we hated one another. James reminds us in James chapter 4 and verse 17 that if a person knows to do something good and they do not do it, it becomes sin in his life. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 20 said, For there is not a just man upon the face of the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Psalm 53 and verse 3, Every one of them, speaking of us, have gone backwards. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no not one. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. But we all are as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we all do fade as the leaf. Our iniquity like the wind have taken us away. You remember as we said last week. That God's standard for man in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48 is, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And then you come over to uh, chapter 2 and verse 1 of 1 John, and John lays down the standard. My little children, I am writing you to make you and help you understand that you are not to sin. We live in a corruptible world. We are housed in a body of sinless flesh. Therefore, we are constantly in this battle and in this struggle against fighting sin and resisting the urge to sin in our life. There's not a person sitting in this room I don't care how often you come to church, how much of your Bible you read, how much time you spend in prayer. There's not one of us that does not fall short of God's expectation in our life. And we're all constantly having the urge to sin. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Paul said, this I say then, walk in the Spirit... And you shall not fulfill the lust, the desires of your flesh. Why? Because the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one unto the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. There's a constant battle going on inside of our bodies, inside of our mind, inside of our spirit. The Spirit of God said, this is the way to live your life. The flesh says, but I want to do this. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof. 
Don't yield your instrument. Don't yield the members of your body to unrighteousness unto sin, but always yield yourself unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. We are not to give sin any area of our life. That's why over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, Paul said, bring every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. All that we are and all that we can become in our life, Jesus Christ wants us to become more like him every day. Church, we'll never, we'll never achieve perfection. You'll never be able to live a sinless life as long as we live in this physical, sinful body of flesh. We're going to struggle to be holy. We're going to fight and struggle to be righteous and godly. We're going to always have a contention against those things that we know that are right. But we are to be spiritual and godly and righteous as much as possible. We are to gain spiritual ground. We are to continue to grow in righteousness. That's why 2 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of the Son of God. He wants us to constantly have a spiritual growth pattern in our life. We're to become more and more like Jesus Christ as long as we're on this earthly journey. Paul referred to it over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. He said we live our life and we achieve glory by glory, bit by bit, a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow. Each day he said we're to be growing in our faith and in our, in our holiness and in our righteousness toward God. But we must demonstrate, while we've always got this sin nature, we are to always demonstrate a sincere desire to be like Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord knows our hearts. God sees through all of our pretense and half-hearted commitment. But we must struggle. We must fight. We must war against the sinful desires and temptations of the flesh and of the mind. I mean, he gives us so many words of encouragement. Isaiah 116, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. You remember when that woman was caught in adultery in John chapter 8 and they brought her before Jesus? And after Jesus said to them, well, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone at her. And Jesus reached back down and was writing in the sin. And when he looked up, all of her accusers were gone. And Jesus said, where are thy accusers? She said, well, they've all left. And Jesus said to her, well, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 34, and he said, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak to your shame. Job chapter 11 in verse 4, iniquity. If iniquity be in my hand, put it far away from thee and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacle, in thy body. Uh, Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and I will have mercy upon him and God will abundantly pardon Paul said in Ephesians 4 and verse 22, speaking to us, put off the, put, and that you put off concerning the former lifestyle, the old man which was corrupt according to deceitful lust. I think what Paul is saying is this, quit acting like you used to act before you came to Jesus Christ. Quit acting like a person who doesn't know God and who is estranged from God. He says in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. 
Do you know that kind of tells me that every one of us in this room have some pet sin that constantly hounds us. We've got one certain sin that always seems to knock us off our spiritual equilibrium. All of us have at least one sin that's always hounding us in our life. And Paul said, lay aside every weight, and in particular, notice, recognize, identify that sin that so easily knocks you off your spiritual track. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul. We must be spiritually sensitive, and we must do all that we can do to please God and bring honor to Jesus Christ. Now notice again what John says. My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. Pretty high standard. Don't commit one single act of sin. But, that's such a precious word. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The believer is not to commit one single act of sin. But if we do, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God's great and wonderful provision for man's sins. And notice that John says two things about Jesus Christ in, these, in this passage. To me, this is, are the two most important verses in all the Word of God because it covers the sin issue and it covers every person who's ever breathed breath upon the face of the earth. He said, first of all, Jesus Christ is our advocate. And the word advocate describes somebody who is called in to stand by somebody else's side. And the purpose is they are to be there as a helper, as an encouragement. They are to do whatever they can to assist this person in their need. In other words, it's the picture of a friend who is called to help somebody who's troubled or distressed or confused. It's the picture of a military general or a commander who is called in uh, to help his discouraged and dispirited troops, and he's called in to give them a word of encouragement. It's the picture of a lawyer, an advocate, who is called to help someone who is a defendant who needs somebody to plead their case before the judge. It's a, it's a Greek word. It's the word uh, parakletos. And I don't believe that there's one English word that properly could describe that word, parakletos. But I think if you had to take one word to try to help us understand it, he's simply saying this, a parakletos is a helper, an encourager, one who stands there in a great time of need. Sin. In the life of the believer, it causes stress and confusion and discouragement, and it causes him to be dispirited. Sin severs our fellowship with God, and it creates a sense of guilt and condemnation and separation from God. You ever tried to pray? And the first thing that happens when you try to pray is that the Spirit of God reminds you of sin that's in your life. And so you don't feel like you can pray. You feel condemned. You feel cut off from God. That's the effect of sin in a person's life. But John said Jesus Christ is our advocate. He stands before God and he pleads our cause. A Christian needs an advocate. 
Because we have an adversary, the devil, who is constantly accusing us before God. I wonder how many times this week your name has been brought up in the presence of God because of the sin you committed. He's always there accusing the brethren. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, watch how you're living. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, and John said, I heard a loud voice saying from heaven, now is salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down which accused them before God day and night. I guess we would have to say in a courtroom setting that the devil is the prosecuting attorney. And the Lord Jesus Christ is our legal advocate. He's the defense attorney. He's called in to help. He's called in to defend. He's called in to counsel and comfort us. And as he pleads the Christian's case before the throne of God, he is providing a continued remedy and covering for our sin. I want you to notice quickly. Two things about the advocate. What qualifies Jesus Christ to be our advocate? Little children, these things write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. The righteous one. He's the holy sinless, perfect sin of God. He laid down his life to redeem sinful man. He is the only one qualified to stand before God because of his holiness, his righteousness. And God, listen carefully, God will never condemn anyone for whom Jesus Christ intercedes. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost. He's able to save them completely. It makes no difference what you've done in your life, how vile, how wicked, how evil, how, how, how godless it is. He's able to save us to the uttermost. All of those that come to God unto by him, for he said he... All that come to God, that, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's the righteous one. He presents himself as your defendant, and he defends and he stands before you as your advocate. But secondly, what is the basis of his plead? He stands before the judge. He doesn't stand there and say, well, let me tell you about Roy Maddox's reputation as a believer. Let me tell you about, let me tell you about uh, Doug's good works. He never pleads our innocence or our guilt for the sin that we're being accused of in the presence of God. He does not plead our personal righteousness. He does not plead our best efforts. When Jesus Christ stands before God to plead your case, Jesus Christ pleads your case. He doesn't plead your case. He pleads his own righteousness and his sacrifice for your sin. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died for you, yea, rather risen again, and he's ever at the right hand of God to make intercession 
for us. Hebrews 2 in verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Made like unto sinful man. That he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He says over in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. And verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens. It is Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But in all points he was tempted just like we are. Yet he is without sin. He says the same thing basically in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 25 through 27. He says again in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24, For Christ hath entered into heaven itself, now he is there to appear in the presence of God for us. Satan may charge the throne of God 24 hours a day with accusations against you. But every time he enters the courtroom of God to accuse you, there is our advocate standing in the presence of the Father. And whatever accusations he may make against us, Jesus Christ said, I've paid for that sin already. He is our advocate who presents himself to the Father for our sin. But notice secondly, he's not just our advocate. Verse 2 says, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That word propitiation, it means to be a sacrifice, a covering. It deny or expresses a, a satisfaction, a payment. He's really saying this, Jesus Christ is an appeasement for our sin. Man needed a covering. He needed a sins to be paid for against God who is perfect and God who is perfect, he demands perfection from man who he created in his own image and in his own likeness. And because God created man in his image and his likeness, God expected man to be perfect in his presence. And because man violated the word of God, God became anger angry and his wrath towards sinful godless rebellious man swelled up in God's heart God demands that all sin be paid for God is holy God is just he's perfect love he's perfect holiness but God is also perfect justice God can love but God also must Judge all sin. Therefore, we must, he must execute judgment against the sinner. And the only way God's justice can be satisfied is through the offering of a perfect sacrifice. You remember in the Old Testament that every year they had to offer a perfect little spotless lamb uh, for the, the, to atone for their sin, knowing that the shedding of that blood would appease God. It would satisfy God to cover their sin. That's what they believed in their heart. But those, the blood of uh, goats and animals and bulls could never appease God. They could never satisfy God. That's why they came in year in and year out. But man never was able to produce a perfect human sacrifice because all men are born in sin. It's what David said in Psalm 51, 5. 
He reiterated in Psalm 58 and verse 3. Paul said in Romans 5 and verse 12, Wherefore as by sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. He says it again in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, that man is sinful, therefore humanity could never produce a sinless sacrifice. Jesus Christ is the ideal and perfect man. We just read over in Hebrews 7 and verse 25, he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. You remember, and we'll study this later on in chapter 2 of 1 John, over in verse 15 and 16, where he said, that Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He is saying that every sin that man commits falls into one of those three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. You go to Matthew chapter 4, when Satan approached Jesus in the wilderness, he approached Jesus with each of those three areas. If you're the Son of God, turn these uh, stones into bread. Well, if you're the Son of God, cast yourself down from the temple, and, and the Lord will save you. He tempted Jesus in the same three areas of sin that you and I are tempted with every day. He was tempted like as we are, yet he was without sin. Jesus Christ became the ideal, the perfect man. And Jesus Christ sacrificed his life for man. And his sacrifice covered our sin. In the death of Jesus Christ, God accepts his death as the sacrifice for our sin. The covering for our sins. The satisfaction for our sins. And the payment for our sins. Jesus Christ, listen carefully, appeased the wrath and the anger of God. And when Jesus Christ pleads for a sinner before the throne of God, he simply presents his life as a sacrificial death. I paid the price for their sin. And God's anger and God's wrath is completely and eternally satisfied and appeased. Propitiation is not placating a vengeful God, but rather it is satisfying the righteousness of a holy God. Therefore, making it possible for him to show mercy and righteousness to anyone and everyone who will come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 said, He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Romans chapter 3 verse 24 and 25 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. Whenever Jesus Christ stands in the presence of God and presents himself, it is canceling your debt to God forever. That's why James said, or John says, the first test is a person's belief in who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done and what Jesus Christ continues to do in our stead. That's why he says man must have a proper understanding of sin because it's sin that separates man from God. 
And even though we've been redeemed, we've been saved, he says, in your life, you've got this uh, old Adamic flesh, this, this worldly body you live in. You've got this corrupt mind that still lies between your two ears that creates lust and temptation to swell up in your life. And he said, you'll never, you'll never be sinless, but you need to understand, in order to maintain your fellowship with God, there must be this conscious confession of your sin before God, realizing that Jesus Christ has satisfied the anger and the wrath of God. Like that publican in Luke chapter 18 and verse 13. Notice the humility. He would not so much as even lift his eyes toward heaven. Have you ever felt that unworthy? Have you ever felt that godless? Have you ever felt so ashamed that you couldn't even as much as look up to heaven? All you could do is look down and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Listen to what 1 John 4 and verse 9 says. In this was manifest the love of God toward us. We talk about God loving us. We talk about Jesus Christ loving us. John says this, and this is the manifestation. This is the demonstration of God's Lord love toward us because he sent, God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Folks, we can talk about God loving us all day long and God being a God of love. But you see the God, love of God demonstrated in the fact that he sent his only begotten son into this world to satisfy your sin problem. And herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. Sent his son to pay the price for our sin that we could not pray. Sent his son that he might appease the wrath and anger of God. God is angry at sin, but God is not angry at the sinner unless he rejects Jesus Christ as the payment for his sin. He is the propitiation for our sins. God has a standard for his church. You're Christians. You say you love God. You say you love Christ. You say you've accepted Jesus Christ in your life. Wonderful. Well, from here on, don't commit one single act of sin. And if you do, you remember, you have an advocate, Jesus Christ, who will stand and plead your case before God and simply make this declaration. That sin that he committed, I have already paid for upon the cross. And if we could ever grasp that truth, it would change the way we live our life. For every day we would strive not to be sinless, but to be sinless every day than we did the day before. That's how joy and happiness comes into life. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? It's strange we were sitting having a little prayer meeting where every Sunday a few of us men meet together upstairs to have a time of prayer. And one of the guys said to me when we got through praying, well, preacher, you know, the Bible talks about the wheat and the tares and the sheep and the goat. When you're standing up preaching, what do you think, how many people do you think in our church are really Christians? And I was honest. I said, well, as pastor, I like to think that everybody in that room is a Christian. That everybody in that room, when they die, is going to go to heaven. That everybody in that room realizes that Jesus Christ 
paid their sin debt. But I said, because the word of God is true, I know there's probably some tares among the wheat. I know there's probably some goats among the sheep. But that's not for me to decide or me to judge. My job is to preach the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit of God to convict their heart and open their spiritual minds to truth. Church, only God knows your heart this morning. Only God knows how you really believe about Jesus Christ. Whether he's just somebody you think about on Sunday when you come to church. Or whether he's somebody you think about when, you know, some disaster or some heartbreak or some threat comes up in your life. But folks, what do you really believe about Jesus Christ? Is he worthy to have the control of your life? That's the question about Jesus Christ. And what do you believe about sin? Do you realize that every day we all fall short of the glory of God? Every day we all fall short of God's expectation for our life. When it comes to that, do we, do we humble ourselves in the presence of God and realize Jesus Christ gave his life that I might be received by God? I don't know what's in your heart, what's in your life. Not asking you for a church member. Not asking you if you've ever been baptized. I'm asking you, have you ever given Jesus Christ the control of your life? Because he is worthy. Every head bowed, every eye is closed. How many of you can say, yes, preacher, I have given Jesus Christ my life? I want you to raise your hand. Think about what you're saying. I've given Jesus Christ my life. That means I'm no longer in control. It's not my way, but his way. It's not my will, but his will. I have given Jesus Christ my life. If you've done that, then God has some very high expectations for your life. Father, I thank you this morning for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on our lives. And I thank you, Lord, for the honesty of the people sitting in this room. For when I ask people to raise their hand, not all of them raised their hands, either because they didn't understand the question, they don't understand the commitment, or Lord, they're just being honest that they've never come to the place where they can fully trust you with their life. And my prayer is, Lord, that today you'll be with those who've never truly acknowledged Jesus Christ and who've never trusted him with the control of their life. I pray the Spirit of God would touch their hearts, open their minds, that they might know and realize Jesus Christ, Christ can be trusted with our life. Help us, Lord, with our sin problem and help us, Lord, to every day bring our life into your presence in the light of your love, in the light of your investigations that we might be what you desire us to be in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he's our advocate and pleads our case, but Lord, also that he is the propitiation. He's the one who satisfied you in your anger and wrath toward our sin. And we'll thank you in his name. Amen. You may stand with me. Let's just sing a verse, Brother Landon. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. all I need He's all I need Jesus is all I need If you're not in the way
than in a life group. And you're going to go to the same one. We're asking you just go sign the sheet that you're going to be in. If you're not in one, there's a map on the back wall. You can look where the locations are. You can go around and check out each table. But please, we would love for you to sign up and get involved with the life group. We're going to have our bi-weekly groups are going to have seven meetings between now starting September 10th and the first week in December. So please have a blessed week. Hope to see you Wednesday night at seven o'clock here in the sanctuary for Bible study and prayer meeting. And we would love for you to get involved in a group. Thank you.